Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Feraldi. And I'm Brian Stoffel. Welcome to another episode of Stocks from Scratch. In this series, we take stocks that are recommended to us by people on Twitter that we don't know, and we research them in real time from scratch. Brian, the stock we're talking about today is App Harvest, ticker APPH. Is this a stock you know? I only know about it because I thought when I looked at the name that it meant app as in like what you have on your smartphone and harvest as in like a way to connect you with a local farmer. I mean, it's a little bit about that, but the app does not in fact stand for an app on a phone. Yes, it is. That is that is correct. I know a little bit about this company because I have heard it pitched on Twitter before. I know it's ag tech. I know it's something to do with like next generation food growing. But it will be inter- this is a this is a popular stock that people upvoted on Twitter. So with that, ready to get into it? Let's dig in. Okay. So as always, we are going to start uh, with our uh, our checklist. The ticker symbol is APP. Uh, H, we are going to uh, fill out two things today. One, the Feraldi quality score, and two, the anti-fragile score. Uh, Those will be scored here, and we will get those going with a new uh, search. So the way we start is App Harvest Investor Relations. Uh, I see presentations. That always makes things easy. Yes, it does. Okay, so I see Analyst Day presentation. Uh, so we'll open that up. I see Q1 earnings presentation. We'll open that up. Let's go to financial information and click on SEC filings. So you see, I see a greenhouse in the back. Uh, so this is not apps. And we will go with, let's see, do they have any proxies? They have a DEF. Kind of. Uh, that doesn't look all that current. Uh, let's go with registration statements. Uh, so there's a most recent one. Uh, so... Uh, the S1A four two. Yeah, so it looks like they came public relatively recently. Yeah. So we'll click. We'll click on that. See if that is their uh, most recent uh, annual report. Nope, that's not a full one. Four two four B four is a typical one that we are looking for. Uh, I'll try this one. Is that the full document? Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, there looks you go. Better. There we go. Uh, okay, but we will start with the presentation. Oh no, we start with the presentation so we can uh, get to know this thing better. Is that zoomed in fairly well? If you could zoom in just one more, sure. All right, so we're gonna look at Q1 first. Oh no, I meant to do the uh, the other one. My mistake. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there we go. Perfect. That's okay, great. so this is their most recent investor presentation. Okay. Disclaimers, etc. App Harvest is building a resilient food system for America. That's enormous. That is a big building. That looks That's- like the Giga Factory. Yeah, it does. For tomatoes. It does. It does. It does. Okay, company overview. Founder and CEO Jonathan Webb, Chief Sustainability Officer, Chief Financial Officer. Okay, company overview. Management team here. We have a founder who likes wearing hats. Uh, that's good. Uh, we have a whole bunch of people who's on the board. Oh, the CFO of impossible foods. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, that's um, something we know the Martha, person next to her, Martha Stewart. Hey, JD uh, Vance. Do you know JD Vance? So JD Vance is, he, he's written down there that he's a partner, but what he's really known for is he's the author of Hillbilly Elegy, which was a best selling book and it was turned into a movie. Oh, did not know that. All right. So some names on here we recognize. The, uh, the tie-in there being that the app stands for Appalachia, and this is where he's from. Ish. Okay. All right. Uh, app Harvest, developer and operator of applied technology, large-scale controlled indoor farms, producing U.S.-grown fresh produce for national grocers. Okay. The ag market outlook. Global food production is woefully short of estimated future needs. Innovation is required to meet demand. Strong demand for local, safe, and reliable produce. No question there. Uh, strategically located in Kentucky, ideally suited for at poverty growth, multidimensional product management team, executing on its scale, sustainable drivers. Yep. Okay. Key partners. Uh, Dals- Dalsam, specialized in high tech greenhouse project with over 85 years of experience. That's a partner. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And Mastrana, one of the largest producers and distributors of greenhouse-grown produce in America. So I've seen that logo, that sunset yeah, I logo. Too. 
I, didn't, I guess the company is called Mastronardi. Okay. Significant market opportunity for lots, thousands of acres, 20,000 acres of potential development. Uh, early investors, we saw some of them. Pipe investors, fidelity and inclusive capital. Okay. A world is in, in agricultural crisis. We need more food. Tons of fresh water is already dedicated to agriculture. Buy, buy all that. Mm hmm. 69% of all fresh vine crops in the U.S. were imported. Okay. Now, see, that's the one I'm more interested in personally. Is, in, is the importation? Yeah. I mean, when I just, this is an aside, but when I see that green one, when it talks about how much food we'll need, I mean, the way it works is if we have less food, food becomes more expensive. People start having fewer kids. Like if you go back to the Great Recession, our fertility rate plummeted. So, I, I mean, predictions like that are always subject to, adaptation which can happen but the fact that we import so much of it that is a really big deal to me fair and it does seem that 70 percent comes from mexico 18 percent from canada so those are our direct neighbors and a vine crop oh i guess we used to grow much more than we did now okay vine crop secular shift from plant-based food is creating a demand for locally grown high quality produce and no question there i buy that Increased need to replace imports with domestically grown produce. Wow. So to tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. So we import way more food now than we used to, at least on a percentage basis. And that's just 10 years ago. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So the market opportunity. Leafy greens is the number one category in produce. Okay. So uh, leafy greens product year over year sales growth. Uh, good to see. Good to see. Boring uh, salad is uh, yeah. is in a bull market. <laughs> salad kits, look at that. Yeah. Oh, I buy these things weekly. Oh, I uh, do too. It, okay. So, I get two of them. There you go. Uh, so seven billion dollars in lettuce sales. Okay. Uh, how do we grow these things? Open field is unreliable, low yield, huge environmental, land, water, chemical, labor costs. Right. So with a high tech greenhouse. It's reliable. You 30x the yield, and it's less land, less water, less chemicals, or no chemicals, or very, it doesn't say no chemicals. This is less chemicals, less labor, less food supply. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised if it's no chemicals. I mean, if you think about it, it's to control the, uh, the pests more than anything. And if you're enclosed, hopefully, I mean, I guess they could still. They're still getting in. Yeah. But but maybe maybe if you grow like there there's it's much more controllable if if yes. it's not exposed to the outside. Yeah, no, I just I had to that. think about it. I find aphids on my uh, on my broccoli every now and again, so they find a way into my fridge. Yep, uh, seventy percent of the population is within a day's drive of the Appalachia. Okay, wow. Kentucky is the twelfth wettest state in the country. Significant job demand, untapped workforce. Yep, buy all that. Region is committed to ag tech. So servicing the East Coast. Significant distribution advantage. Shorter delivery distances mean vegetables and are fresher and more nutritious. Mm. So closer, uh, less transport. I believe that. I buy that. I, hmm, I, I also buy that. I remember hearing a podcast on NPR that talked about like the environmental footprint of like growing something from a long distance away and it's like on a per unit basis it's extremely small because mm -hmm. we're just importing such massive quantities of it and shipping by shipping by boat is extremely efficient mm -hmm. um so is this an advantage sure is it as big of an advantage as the company is claiming i'm a little bit skeptical oh, that's fair this is very similar to i did vital farms once and they do the same thing where their mega egg production facility is located in roughly the same area so, for the same and, reason, but I do, I do, I do buy all this that it's many fewer hours, so that might result in fresher uh, produce. Although right. with tomatoes and stuff like that, you pick them and then they ripen on the way there and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, is it an advantage? It's an advantage. How big of an advantage? I don't know. Agreed. Uh, access to top grocers, Walmart, Publix, Costco, Target, Kroger. So they have oh, okay. Distributors will sell all produce grown by distributor. Distributor will sell all produce. So they're not are they not direct partnerships? Hmm. Interdistribution agreement with Mastrarnardi, a leading distributor that will sell all produce produced by App Harvest. They're selling it's, everything. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. 
So that's um, I'm guessing we're going to have some significant Concentrate. customer concentration risks. Yes. Like one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they, their outlets are, the outlets are there. I was figuring that if you're going to go this, you'd want to just have a direct relationship with all these businesses. But from a uh, simplicity point of view, going with one master distributor is easier. But anyway, okay. I'd want to know what the contract says. Yep. Partner of Partnership, Art Havis, Parvis, Pioneering Ad Tech Platform, 17 organizations, as well as the three. So we partner with all these Companies, okay. Solutions and tech providers, LED lighting, climate refrigeration. So they have a lot of partners. I haven't heard of any of these. Have you? No, but does it say over there it is working with the Dutch and Kentucky governments? Have you ever heard anybody putting those two together in the same sentence? I know that the Dutch are like masters of this. Like this technology, the Dutch okay. have been doing this for a long time. Long, long, long time. Um, so that's a good thing. Technology drives yields. So we have nano bubble technology. By supplementing our rainwater with oxygen, we increase nutrient absorption. Huh. Okay. Robot scouting. Eco Ecoization combines human expertise with sophisticated sensor measurements. We have a scouting cart. Climate screening. So they're okay. So they're partnering with all these upstart businesses. Okay. Phillips, I know that name. Yeah, that's uh, not upstart. For LED lighting, for for this is all state of the art. Yep. Well, I buy that. Okay. Uh, less diesel expectation to be used in transportation. 80%. 90% less water. 10 acres of rainwater retention pond. 30x higher yields. 40x increase in lighting efficiencies due to our LEDs. Thousands of jobs. Zero runoff. That's a big deal. Yeah. For the environment. I don't know. Yep. It depends on how well they educate people on it, but. Yep. Grown year round. Okay. So this is their facility. Huge. That's enormous. First planting was last year. All right. Our team. Uh, these guys, growers, growers, growers. They do lots of inside assistant growers. They promote their team. Growing in Moorhead. There's a bee. So they're using bees. Uh-huh. Okay, uh, what's this? Uh, future facilities, Richmond, Kentucky, Berea, Kentucky. Okay, this is going to be to grow vine crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. This is going to be to grow lettuce. So, okay, construction. We're partnering with NRG, Belltech, Ingram, Ex Exxon Mobil. <laughs> not not a not a company I was expecting to see in this presentation. Right. Uh, Individual projects valid over uh, 1.8 billion. Okay. They already did it once. Yeah. So uh, theoretically, they learned a lot and can take those learnings and get better. Okay. So this is their pipeline. So 2021, they have Moorhead, which is 60 acres. Uh, Berea is going to be 15. Richmond is going to be 60. Pulse County is going to be 10. Identified for 2023 under option. Uh, so, man, this company's going to be spending some money. And to put next... it in perspective, I mean, so that's what 60 acres looks like. That's way bigger than I would have thought. And they said there's seventeen to 20,000 acres. Yeah. So you add all this up and that gets you maybe 200. Uh, okay. Probably a little bit more than that. Okay. Uh, okay. So AOL founder. Ooh, AOL co-founder Steve Case. Blake Griffin. Okay. Media coverage. Yep. Thoughts, leadership, and ag tech. Brian, do you like it when companies are really pro getting their name out there? Like, I guess. So, I, I mean, we're, we're going to work through this. I am a little bit in, usually no, because I think that the product should speak for itself. But so much of where our food comes from has to do with the story behind it. Cause lettuce is lettuce is lettuce is lettuce. It can't tell you its story. You know what I mean? So I, I'm willing to make an exception in this case, especially because I don't know where the moat is right here. Like this is all awesome. I love all of this. I want it to succeed. I want it to do well. And I want to know how come I couldn't get a whole bunch of people together and do the exact same thing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair. Um, 
certified B Corp. We're investing $1 billion. On the flip side, I will say they, this is a company that's going to have to raise capital and spend it. To raise mm -hmm. capital, you need a high stock price. To get a high stock price, you want hype, you want investor. So I understand why they're they're focused on that. Yeah, I mean, between Steve Case, Martha Stewart, and J.D. Vance, they've done that part of it. Sure. Okay, we're education, prioritizing the worker, certified B Corp. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a plus. Again, the ESG angle here is A plus. Very high. Yep. We pay 40% higher than comparable jobs in Kentucky. That's crazy. Um, I can see this being an attractive place to work. We'll see if the Glassdoor numbers back that up. We're a B Corp. We do transparency. Oh, Vital Farms is a B Corp. Oh, there you go. Um, potential value creation of certified B Corp. There are, wow, there's 3,800. Yeah, but oh, most of them are oh, publicly Only traded. 11 are publicly traded. Yeah. Vital Farms. I don't know where yet. Education, Lemonade. I know Viva is, Viva is one of them. Is it? Yeah, they, they transition. There you go. Okay, our goals. Uh, more education, more yeah, climate action, et cetera. Okay, so let's date into the numbers. Great. Uh, awesome. So it's a company I'm rooting for. Yes. Am I, I investing in it? Well. I don't know. <laughs> has entered in a business combination with Novus Capital, uh, closed in early 2021. So it's a SPAC. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's got a $370 million pipe, $30 million convertible note. Transaction uh, implies a, an enterprise value of $570 million. Uh, existing shareholders will get half of it. Capital structure. Do you see with valuation what numbers they're going based on there? Uh, no, but we can check the stock price afterwards. But, but I'm just saying 2024, like they're, um, they're oh, right there. They're way in the future. Yeah, yeah. Two to 2.2 times a, a projected revenue of 258 million. 2.2 times. So I mean, that sounds like a low number for a growth company, but what's this company's margin structure going to be? It's selling lettuce. Yeah. I'd imagine pretty low margin. <laughs> um, okay. So they've got a billion dollars in. Total capital, uh, stocks, total uses. So, okay, so, okay, so here's what it looked like pre after coming public. The market cap will be 1 billion. So, this is at 10 bucks per share um, with 464 million in cash. Mm -hmm. So, it's an enterprise value of, of okay. Okay, so public, public shareholders will own, uh, well, more, more now, but uh, okay. Tomato economics capital cost is a hundred to one hundred thirty-five million. That's not that bad. Wow, one hundred thirty-five million to build. Well, I guess I guess if it's low tech, right? And by low tech, I mean that they don't have all the things densely in there that you'd have an Amazon fulfillment center. Yeah. So if you buy these numbers, which are illustrative steady-state economics, uh, forty-three million bucks in revenue. Um, and then the gross profit would be 17 million. So that's a gross margin of, uh, what's that? 30. Yeah. What's, uh, 17, no more uh, than 30 by 42, roughly, roughly 40%. Yeah. Wow. That's way higher than I thought it was going to be. Um, way higher utility. Well, I guess if you're, if you, here's the thing, if you're selling, the lettuce, tomatoes, whatever, for the same price as everything else, but you're producing 30x more than open field techniques. Now, obviously, they're probably competing against people that are doing it, not just open field, but still. Uh, okay, so here's their projected financial numbers. So 12 facilities by 2025, most of which will be vine crops, uh, a little bit of leafy greens, and active facility, you up to 12. So they expect this to grow. Net revenues are expected to explode. Um, so let's just pretend that this is correct. Pretend times a 40%. So that gives them 200 million roughly, a little under 200 million in 2025 gross profit uh, by 2025. Mm -hmm. Free cash flow before growth spend. Okay, that's not free cash flow. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I don't even know what that means. Uh, if you pretend like our like we're not going to be spending money, this is our free cash flow. I mean, uh, basically, they're saying if we stop in 2025. Yes, that's okay. All right, let's go to their most their most recent quarterly results. Uh, their management team, uh, great. So they have they're a all, they have a president and a CEO. Yeah, they're all futurists, farmer and futurists. CTO, CFO. Okay. Okay. Yep. We just read all this. Uh, we need we need app harvest. So what we've done, we've got our first tomato. Mm -hmm. We started trading in uh, February. First footprints acquires the Moorhead facility, Barrera. So they're growing their facility. Seventy-five million dollar mortgage. From our head farm, okay. Uh, it's all about the vision. In addition to supplying top tier retailers, we're now shipping to Kroger's and Wendy's. Oh, directly. We're uh, di direct to. Yes, you're right. Does that mean that they're not doing it through the company whose name that, I can't pronounce? That's what I would assume as well. Well, but, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, if they can, if they can do that. Um, yes. Okay, so we're doing all this stuff. We're we're growing. Oh, strawberries! Awesome. Mm. I would love some in, indoor strawberries year round. Uh, Root AI acquisition acquisition. We added a technology team specialized in solving complex business platforms. Team expertise. All these things. That looks like a machine behind it that picks. Interesting. Okay. Uh, the supply train, we can solve it with all of our expertise. Robotic workforce is consistent access to skilled workers. So by using robots to do it, sounds really hard. Yeah, that does. <laughs> but if, if they can do it, great. We're going to localize everything, food insecurity. Purpose driven growth. This is very 100% of the products free from chemical pesticide, ready to do. 100% rainwater, climate resilience, and energy efficient. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a wage, 500 employees. Uh, this is pretty good. We'll see if Glassdoor backs that up. That must be on Glassdoor. Um, or no, maybe not. In, in, in employee. Survey. survey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, diversity. Okay. So, okay. So here's what we got. Um, actual results, 2.3 million in sales, 2.3 million pounds sold. Okay. For the full year, they're going to do 20 to 25 million. Revising our long-term model. Um, annual adjusted EBITDA, December. Wait. Steady oh, state. Uh, steady state. The, so they the, they they raised their steady state outlook. They, they they raised their future projections for what they think that they can do. So this is pre coming public. Now they're saying, look, we're going to do even better. Interesting. With sixty percent leverage, though sixty percent leverage. So this will be a debt driven company. It has to be. Yeah. Wait, wait. Can you go up to that picture? Sure. I just want to. So it looks like that is something a machine picking. The tomatoes. Tomatoes. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, net loss in the quarter was 26 million, uh, 20, 29 million, uh, 6 million of which was, uh, okay, a bunch of that was warrants. So that's not a, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of one time costs because of yeah. the, uh, the SPAC stuff, uh, et cetera. Uh, okay. So now we're going to the prospectus. Oops. I mean, there's probably oh, not going to be very okay. much. Yep. In terms of uh, results. Yeah. Uh, we got the business, potential conflicts, the offering. So it came public at 10. Oh, this is the um, this is the previous one. Okay. I don't know how useful that SEC document is going to be. Let's see if we can go to their news release. Do they have their solid? Yeah. Okay. So this is their first quarterly results. Company delivered net sales of 2.3 million. Okay. Uh, yep. 
so we saw this. So at, as at the end of the quarter, $297 million in cash. Uh, we'll get into the, the team is putting grace, taking an appointment from around 20. Okay. Yep, very focused on employment. I have Harvest has a long-term distribution with Master on a products to sell. Uh, can you read that okay, Brian? Uh, it's a little grainy. There you go. Uh, I'll zoom in. Volume is now increased for direct shipment of full truck loads to retail customers, such as Kroger's and Wendy's, building on uh, building on App Harvest's existing relationship with Mastronardi. So that's that they're just shipping there, but it's through these guys. Yeah. Okay. That's a very important relationship. Yeah, you think so? Well, especially <laughs> given especially given the fact that it's pretty clear that they're going to be spending money hand over fist for quite a while. There's not yeah. going to be as much room for error. And so taking on some type of expense like that, if they lose them, I think would almost be impossible. Yep. Okay. Um, so here's the EBITDA loss for the full year. So add some more to that. So call it, I don't know, 60 million bucks, 80 million bucks that they're going to lose this year. And again, they have cash of 297 plus CapEx growth. So they will likely be raising capital again. I mean, they're going to have to. Yeah, a bunch. All right. Oops. But uh, they still have, is that uh, March 31st? So they still have some private war warrant li liabilities. Uh, no, no debt that I see as of yet. Or maybe that's just what that non-current liabilities is. They didn't even uh, break that out. Non-current liabilities. Totally oh no no no! no. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. I was reading it wrong. I yeah, okay. Yeah. So I don't see any any uh, debt. Okay. So their gross margin in the first quarter was really negative. Not all that surprising. They're nowhere close to scale. Um, but you know, just keep that in mind. They're they just started. Hooray! We have revenue. That's a that's a very good thing. They it went is. from no revenue to revenue. Um, but I'm curious how quickly it'll take them to scale to scale this number uh, into the positive column. Okay. Uh, their net loss was okay. So again, their net loss was 28 million um, on a cash basis. Their net loss, their their free cash flow for the quarter was negative 47 million. I would even throw. I mean, wouldn't that next line item, or is that the acquisition? I'm guessing that is for, oh from a related party. Maybe they, they maybe that's no, that would be PP and E for that. So yeah, they. They should have had like 400 million on their books, but now they have 130 million dollars less. <laughs> yeah, this is how much yeah. they raised, and this is why their their cash balance is only 297. Yeah, um, make right. no mistake, this company is going to be spending tons and tons of money, but the assets are going to be long long lived. Uh, Brian, because this is a SPAC, I don't know if we're going to get all the usual things that we usually get when we look at a uh, S1. Well, that's okay. That'll be a really good educational tool for anyone watching yep. this. Of some of the, the downsides of SPAC. Yep. Uh, principal stockholders. Here we go. Um, what was the CEO's name? Uh, Webb. Jonathan Webb. Uh, I don't see him on here. Uh, after offering. Uh, so this guy sold. Sold. Oh, no. Yeah, sold a little bit. So insiders did sell a little bit as part of the transaction. Boy, that's really low. 7.1%. Uh, to me, it is. Yeah. Why is that guy's name not on here? Well, he Prince. just might not own any. He's got to own something. Um, I'll keep looking. Certain transactions. That's yeah, surprising. again. Yeah, again. I, I, I mean, he's the founder. I'm sure he owns something. How much I don't know. <laughs> oh, he, what about this? This is where we were before. Oh, uh, all of the founder shares outstanding with respect to f all of the founder shares. Okay, yeah. This this is again why 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 SPACs can become so tricky um, for us in particular. I mean, I am not. I am not. I've never invested in a SPAC, Brian. Of you. Uh, I'm just thinking back. No. Okay. I don't know if we're missing something here that's obvious, but I don't see the guy's Can name on here. you just type in his name? W-E-B-B -B, B -B. real quick. Webb? I mean, uh, that's not it. It's not? Jonathan Webb? 
WEBB. I don't see his name on there. Maybe, yeah. I, I, maybe again, because that's the, the SEC documents that we're looking at are not the right ones. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, well, let's look at the 10Q. This is their, from their quarterly report. You don't get concentration stuff in here, do you? Not usually. Usually that's just in the annual report. Yeah. Concentration. Okay. Uh, executive orders and the respective affiliates as a group owned 39% of our common stock. Huh. That is very odd. So that's very different than what we just saw. Yeah. So, But that might have been for the SPAC itself. Yeah. Because there's documents related to that. Again, I, that's one of the reasons I like to look for. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why companies like this kind of are a little bit confusing and a little bit harder to, to, uh, to research. Well, you, um, while you keep going, I'll, I'll see if I can find something real quick on how much they own. Okay. Uh, well, while I'm here, let's go to Glassdoor. Glassdoor app harvest. Okay. Let's see if those wonderful things they're touting uh, follow through with what employees say. All right, four reviews, useless, <laughs> uh, useless. App Harvest is on a mission to feed the future from the heart of the Appalachia, from the heart of Appalachia. It's on a mission to feed the future from the heart of Appalachia. Okay, four, four stars, 66, uh, mission driven. Okay, I mean, on a scale of one to 10, how, how much do you buy that this company is mission driven? Uh, I would give them at least a seven. I mean, it could definitely go higher than that, but um, yeah. Okay. I mean, what 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 is the to feed the future? That's that's not a mission. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to look at before we start scoring it? Um, I'm I'm just looking up what the mission if they have a different mission statement. Just that doesn't seem. Well, so I'm looking at their website. Let's start with mine. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, App Harvest. Okay. Uh, their balance sheet. Uh, can you see that okay? I'll zoom in more. Yeah, zoom in a little bit. There okay, you go. so App Harvest. So is this company's balance sheet fragile or a fortress? Tons of cash, no debt. I'm going to give them five. Gross margin. The gross margin here is negative. So that's a zero. I'm sure that is going to start improving. I'm sure but it's still negative. Returns on capital, zero. Earnings, free cash flow, zero. Uh, earnings, zero. Let's talk moat. Okay, at scale, will they have the network effect or a product ecosystem? Nope. Will there be switching costs uh, for the consumer? No. Will there be a durable cost advantage? May yes. I mean, that's, yeah. that's where it comes in, right? That is like, going that's... to be the moat. It's going to be scale or and physical and physical location. How are you going to score that? I don't, I don't know how to say like what, I, I don't know how to really give them full credit for that. I can totally see there being scale and there being a distribution advantage. They don't really have it yet. But more importantly to me is, when you're when you're selling a product like this, if you're selling something that's organic, it, it, like you you have to create a brand that your consumers can identify. Is the is the brand going to be App Harvest, and is that brand going to be worth? Will consumers be willing to pay a premium, or are they going to try and sell this at a discount? I didn't see anything about there about we're we're going to be the low cost brand or anything like that. Um, so for right now, um, I'll, I'll I'll guess and give this a seven. Um, out of that, at seven out of fifteen, yes, that could be under, could be over. I don't know. Um, and the brand, I don't see any brand as of yet. The name App Harvest is the company, but is is that is that the brand name? And I don't see any clear signs that this is a brand that consumers want or like or anything like that. So I'm not going to give them any any for that. And to be clear, if I had to take one minute of this whole, uh, if this is an hour long, that last minute of you discussing those things, that the, everything hinges on that. Is, is Everything hinges on, is there actually low cost production? Could there actually be a brand? Because if there is, then all of a sudden this looks pretty good. If there isn't, then I don't want anything to do with it as an investor. Right. 
Uh, rooting for it as a person, not as right. an investor. Uh, counter positioning. Would a competitor, would a lettuce producer be harmed to adopt this company's uh, business model? There might be something to that. If you are a farmer, if you are a mass farmer and you're growing in a field, and then all of a sudden you have to change your ways completely and build these huge greenhouses because it's just a clear, clearly superior way of doing so, um, that could be a bitter pill to swallow because that's got to be incredibly capital uh, intensive uh, up front. But I don't know. I guess you'd I have to give up control of your farm. You would have because to because you need you'd need outside funding. Yes, but there are companies. You know, there are big Dole, for yeah. example. Could could they do it? Sure. Uh, so I will give them some points for that. Um, this is a this is an innovative business. Mm, it's not really a business model because they're just selling lettuce through a distributor but they're growing it in a unique way. But still, I will give them some points. I'll give them three points uh, for that. And uh, I would say that their moat is um, widening, or I'll say it's stable. Uh, it's going to be growing over time. Uh, so that's a, uh, I'll argue that's a pretty generous score um, for, for, the, for the moat so far. Okay, potential. Is there optionality for them within their industry? Yeah. They're growing tomatoes today. They want to grow leafy greens. They want to grow cucumbers. They want to grow tomatoes. What uh, strawberries. strawberries? What else could they grow? There's tons of fruits and vegetables that they could grow. I'll give them a five. Uh, is their organic roadway going to be huge? It better be. Uh, are they the top dog and first mover in an important emerging industry? I'm unaware of any other company that's doing this at this scale. Um, so I'll say yes. And is there operating leverage ahead of this company? Oh my God, yes. Is there a lot of operating leverage ahead of this company? Is it expensive to acquire customers? I don't think they broke that out. Um, but right now, I'm going to say yes. You're trying to build a, if they're trying to build a consumer brand, that's expensive. Uh, so one, once a consumer starts consuming your product, how dependent on are they? Well, Last I checked, you still eat food when uh, when there's a recession. Um, but are they dependent on this product in particular? <laughs> uh, that I'll give them four points out of five for that. The products are recession proof, but will consumers trade down? Maybe. My college diet says no. Okay. They're not uh, dependent. Okay. Is there recurring revenue? Yes. Uh, is there pricing power? Could this company raise prices at will without retaining, without losing customers? I'll say a three there right now. I think they'll be basically able to do it at the rate of inflation. Uh, soul in the game. The founder is running it. The inside ownership. I don't know this 100%. Um, I'll have to do some research on that. But for right now, I'll say yes, there is. I'll give them a two. Uh, the glass door ratings are pretty much useless because there's so there's so few of them. Uh, for that, they seem to get some good reviews from employees. I'll give them a three out of four. Uh, was their mission statement simple, inspiration, and optionable? Uh, their mission statement on Glassdoor is on a mission to feed the future from the heart of Appalachia. Same on their website. Okay. Uh, is that simple? Yep. Uh, inspirational? Yep. Optionable? Yep. I'll give them a three there. Uh, how has their stock done uh, versus the S&P uh, 500? Let's check. I think that the ticker symbol here is at Parvest. APPH, yeah. APPH, how's it done? <laughs> down 60%. Well, I mean, what do you expect? It's, it's Well, it went public. And it's, a, it's a growth game. Yeah, that's rotten timing. Look at, I mean, look at, there, there was not a worse time to go public yes. for investors. February that of 2021. And on the flip side, there wasn't a better time to go public to raise funds. Right. Um, but no points there. I hope they're not buying back stock or paying, uh, repaying debt or anything like that. And how do they do on their first quarterly earnings report? I like it when companies beat earnings. So analysis, uh, let's see how they do. They were expected to do 25 cents and they did minus 35 cents. So they missed. That's a zero. Uh, add all that up and what do we get? A 59. Okay, but we're not through the bad stuff. Uh, accounting irregularities. I hope not. Customer concentration. With no other way to check this out, I have to imagine that they have one customer. Yep. They can pretend that they have a lot of customers, but they have one. Uh, so that is a big uh, minus, minus five. Are they uh, at risk of being disrupted? They are the disruptor. Outside forces, commodity prices. 
not, well, they're doing their own water. We don't know about their inputs, but they might have some commodity price, commodity price exposure. Although if commodity prices spike, that would benefit them. I'm going to say no. Are they a big market loser? Yes. I'm not going to knock off points for this because this is low enough and it's just too soon. Is there a binary event ahead? No. Is it dilution high? I'm guessing it's going to be. We don't have a lot of data to go off of that. For now, I'll just knock off two points. Are they growing by acquisition? Uh, They're even not that, really growing. Not really. Uh, complicated financials, antitrust, headquarter, and currency risk. You add all that up, and I get a 52, which is firmly in my why bother category. Now, all of these things could turn positive. Uh, all of this could turn positive uh, in time. Uh, their moat, I could have misjudged. Uh, so that is a source that they could be wrong here. Uh, their stock could become a winner. Uh, so there's room for this number, this company to become investable. Uh, I fully acknowledge all that. But for right now, I would say it's too, it's too crazy and it doesn't do anything that's like way out of this world cool that I would be willing to take a risk on it right now. Uh, but that's mine. Let's do yours. All right. APPH. Moat. So a mission. Yes, I'm actually going to give it one point, and here's why. To, to feed the future, I, if I'm an employee having to make a decision about what's happening at App Harvest, I can't use that mission to make it. Uh, like, I just, I, I don't know. There's something missing there, and there's so much to like about this company, which makes me a little bit disappointed, but I, I'd have to think for a while, like, what it actually doesn't seem like their mission is. Because it, it seems like it's much more than that. Like it, it seems like they're trying to rebuild the local communities or, or, or something like that. I'm not sure. But I just think that there's something lacking there. Now, for the moat, I agree. No network effect, no switching costs. Um, the low cost is that that's the crux of everything. How much evidence do I have of that? Enough to give them a half point and that's it. Like there's, there's just... There's no way to know at this point. And brand could be very important, but I see absolutely no evidence of that yet. They're they're doing the right things. They've got the right people on their board to build that up, but I don't see any evidence. And then for optionality, I'll give them two points, which is pretty standard for this. I don't see them going outside of growing food. Um, so because I include free cash flow in this, and by my estimates, it's anywhere from negative 30 to a lot. To, to much more than that. <laughs> to yeah. negative much more than that. I'm going to give this a negative one because, I, look, something could happen and, and it could it could ruin things. Concentration risk, this is so tough because the, the, I'm going to give them minus one here, but let me say that it could be much more or it could be none. I would want to look at their contract with Master Darty um, and know more about that because it's, it's got to be a hundred percent concentrated. That's, right. that, that seems to that that's like a thing that they're calling out. But if if they have an ironclad ten year contract, I'm a little bit less concerned. Fair enough. But but I just I don't know. Uh, Glassdoor, I'm going to give them uh, a half a point. Now let me ask is, you this, because yeah. you're talking about that contract. Think about who's at the other end of that contract: Walmart, Target, uh, yeah. those big grocers. Even if that, even from that look through, I'm sure there's huge concentration risks. Yes. So I'm, I'm, yep. I, I'm it's surprising to me that you're only taking off one point there. Well, my point, is my point. I mean, it might be that I want. I'm trying to root this company on. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough, but. But let me just say, I'd call that out as an area for me to spend a lot of time looking yes. at before investing in the company. Fair enough. Uh, Glassdoor, I'll give them a half point. Again, I'm I'm rooting for them. I'm trying to give them some benefit of the doubt. Their founder is involved. It seems like the ownership level is high. But you add that up, and I mean, this comes to four. I mean, that's one of the lowest scores I've we've gotten when we've done this. Yeah. Um, now, there are... The, the anti-fragile framework has a lot. It very rarely gives a high score to a company that ends up being a very poor performer. But it is not uncommon at all for a company to get a low score and end up doing really great things for shareholders. So the reason that I'm passing on this, obviously, I mean, it's pretty clear. It's not because I don't want it to succeed. I want it to succeed. But the reason that I'm passing on this is because the level of risk is just way too high for the way that I do this. And again, I just don't see where the moat is. I mean, it's a good, and that's a good thing if you want to feed the world, right? You don't, you don't want a moat if your goal is to feed the world affordably. 
And, and so the brand is really the only thing that you've got. This is a very easy company to root for. Like yes. it's really easy to root for them. I think they're doing fabulous things in, in the world. And I like the model that they're doing. This is more about, this is the, the lens that we are looking this through is, uh, are we going to invest in, in this? Right. This has huge potential. If they can prove the model works, if they can build a brand, if they can get, if their distribution and their low cost production truly is meaningful, and I'm I'm underweighting the the the, the benefits of there, um, that that could be hugely hugely positive uh, for me right now. This is this is a lottery ticket with revenue, yeah. but it's a lottery ticket, and you need a lot of things to go right to say nothing of this company has basically said, we are going to be spending huge amounts on CapEx. And that is not a good thing when your stock price is down 60%. Yeah. And it, it, I totally agree. Like the stock going down is going to make it that much harder for them to raise the funds necessary to build all of those facilities they say that they're going to build. Um, you know, I, I just, I want to find out more about the company too, because if the brand is not what they're going to go based off of, which it, I, I can't imagine that's not the case given who they have on their board. But if it's not, if, it, if they're just able to produce so much that they truly can offer it at slightly cheaper than everyone else, that would be, I, I have to think about that. Like that would be a really interesting play. That would be amazing. Right? If you, because if you could go to the grocery store and get their tomatoes for the same price as conventionally grown t tomatoes, but theirs are organic, and I, would, I, I would consume them. I mean, yes. I, would, I wouldn't even bother with anything else. But they didn't, they didn't say anything about that. And if, right. if, if that was a thing and, and they didn't tout that from, shout that from the rooftops, then this company is terrible at communications. Right. And, and you know, like as we're going through this, I'm trying to learn the lessons. I'm trying to remember the lessons I learned from investing in Whole Foods. I, Whole Foods was a company I cheered for a ton. Mm -hmm. And I think that companies like this do very well when they have, honestly, I think they do better when they're not public because they have a group of investors and owners who understand what they're trying to accomplish. Whereas if your owners and your investors are just looking to get the most return possible, that's it. It's almost at odds with the mission of the company. Yeah, it's a tricky thing. This it company is. has this company has uh, big ambitions. I like that. I love what they're doing. If if I can buy App Harvest produce in my local grocery store, I will. Like I want I want to try this as a consumer. I want to judge the pricing. Uh, but for right now, as an investor, I don't see anything here that would that would make me go, "Wow, I'm in." Like I, I'm just uh, I'm on the sidelines with the yep. caveat that in time, this company could seriously prove me wrong. And if if that's the case, I would be a happy buyer of this with a ten billion dollar valuation at a significantly lower risk risk level than it's at today. Yeah, let's let's just say it'd be really great if we're wrong about this. Yes, hope I'm, I'm really hoping that we're wrong. But uh, for right now, this is not a company that uh, interests me. There All we right. Go. We we hope you uh, we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you know this company better than us, please let us know what we got wrong. Please answer those questions that uh, that we have uh, uh, about this. As a spec, it's a little bit trickier for us to to research, and I'm still learning how to do that uh, myself. But uh, as always, uh, don't take anything that we say as financial advice. Uh, as you can tell, we've studied this company for about uh, 48 minutes now, so that's how much we 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 know about it. Uh, do your own do your own research. But uh, with that, thank you so much for watching and. We'll see you next time.